Hey, I'm Susanna Mars. I'm an artist, an actor, singer, and voice actress. And I'm also the daughter of veteran actor Kenneth Mars, who played Von Blasco in the new original Wonder Woman. And you're listening to Satin Tights, a Wonder Woman podcast. Last time on Satin Tights, a Wonder Woman podcast. Did Princess Diana ever meet Diana Prince, the nurse, and buy her identity? And this is something that was a big element in the comics. There's a lot of question in people's minds. Was this scene ever filmed? As we see in the final shooting script, it was scripted. But did they ever film this? To my knowledge and to my investigation, the scene was never filmed. I have asked Linda about it. She has said that she doesn't recall filming a scene with another actress who looked like her. Because it was so specific, they had to have an actress that that looks just like her. One thing I have to say, Andy, is when you brought up that um, how it could have been uh, they would have to get someone that looked, you know, similar to Linda. Wouldn't they have executed the whole, you know, use Linda as uh, again as a as a you know split screen and and all that stuff, or or not even split screen? They could have used that a couple of times, but even reverse angle stuff. But at least get her to play Diana Prince so that it wouldn't be so much of a. I mean, that was a hall of the rage back then anyway. You know, they're not going to get somebody that looks... You, how can, you can't get anyone that looks like Linda. Yeah, I'm not sure why they didn't do that, other than that, uh, as we discussed, it was kind of... By now, it was weirdly out of place in the script. And beyond that, it was... It's, it's one of those things like explaining the force. You know, and, and, you know, and when when they started explaining that it was midichlorians instead of it was a force that that surrounded us and bound the galaxy together, I was done. I was done. <laughs> you know, midichlorian. It's a virus. Come on, right? And so that's where I think that's really kind of what killed that scene was that it really was. You know, if we can accept all these other things that have happened, we can certainly accept that she's going to get herself into being the, a nurse. And uh, especially because we've already seen it happen. We, You know, that scene was already in the script. So I think it was just like for once they, they looked at it and said, we don't need to explain this. And I think that was really what happened. I, d- I don't think it was... I don't think it was that they couldn't find an actress or that they couldn't do split screen or anything like that. I think they they were just they realized that it was an unnecessary scene, even if it was integral to the comic. Right. It's kind of akin to uh, explaining how Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson slid down the bat pole and became Batman and Robin. We can just get oh, they become Batman and Robin when they slide down the pole. You don't have to explain it. You get to use your imagination and figure it out on your own. Right, right. Somewhere in the skies, 4,771 miles south, uh, it's a quick shot of Von Blasco flying over Argentina. Now, in the script, he says something like, oh, very nice, or I'd like to live here. It's very pretty. (laughs) I mean... um, in your script, Ray, uh, in Steve's hospital room, before this conversation with General Blankenship, yeah. uh, Steve uh, meets his psychiatrist, Dr. Spelvin. Dr. Spelvin, yes. <laughs> he's, he's being interviewed and, by Dr. Spelvin. <laughs> Captain Dr. Spelvin. Captain Dr. Spelvin. Yeah. <laughs> Was it Major Captain Dr. Spelvin? No, just, just Captain Doctor. Captain Doctor. <laughs> Who's on first? <laughs> Um, it didn't do anything, right? It it just explains basically about Steve's mind being erased by the Amazons and that he can't remember anything. Dr. Spelvin says, our medical intelligence division says that the Germans are experimenting with a new technique called brainwashing. 
which will do just that. <laughs> Brainwatching. <laughs> Brainwatching is a different technique. And then Steve talks about some gaps in his memory, but he's right. ready and raring to go, and Nurse Buck is about to let him do so. Right, right. Even though Dr. Spelvin says no. This is where Steve gets on the phone to Blankenship. The Norden bomb site. Is that being manufactured? My God, Trevor, that must be it. I'll warm up a squadron of P-38s right away. No, no, they wouldn't have a chance. Von Blasco would carve him up with that XV-13. Now, if that bomb site is being manufactured there, then secrecy must be kept. General, warm up my new plane. But you never tested it. And orders are that you stay in bed, Steve. Hello? Hello? Uh, we must have a bad connection here, General. In the script, what we don't see is that, you know, after he hangs up, he grabs his uniform and he heads out just as Nurse Diana Prince is rounding the corner, misses him, but she's she's in her, her nurse Navy uh, nurse uniform, right? Yes, she is uh, in, in this particular scene. She would be dressed in, now she is a Navy nurse, which would be Diana Prince's uniform. Um, she walks into the room, looks around, sees no one is there, walks to the bathroom, peeks in. Steve is gone. So see, in the script, it sort of continues the whole, she bought the identity, now she's bought the clothes and, and, and all that right, stuff. Right, because she wasn't in the white uniform anymore, and now she's the Navy nurse. Yep. General Blankenship's going to go through the roof. You needn't worry. I'll take all the responsibility. I'll send a car to take you out to the base. No, 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 there's no time. I'll catch a cab. If I shortcut along the old Georgetown Road, I should be there at... 1600 hours. Take care, Steve. Don't I always? She hangs up and and Stella Stevens on a dime turns from the sort of ooh right to the, you know, Agent M, picks up another phone, and we don't see what she does, but in in my script, we do have a couple of lines into the phone. She says she gives the route Steve's taking and she says you know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Again, all this stuff appropriately as it is in the in the aired version, it's gone. It's just we don't need to see that. All we need to see is her pick up the phone, right? Yep, right. Uh, we've got uh, Anne Ramsey. This is the first time we'll see her in Wonder Woman, uh, but she's playing uh, a taxi driver, and I love, I love, love, love. <laughs> <laughs> sort of the, again the the comedy bits the the stuff that's that that's set up here can't you go any faster if you want to drive i'll let you drive and they come across this sort of roadblock uh-oh trouble of course it's ashley norman and his thugs uh severn darden is with him and in my script they're dressed in drag really yes, what is they it are. what does it say okay so steve and the driver pull up they turn to steve pull revolvers out of their purses and aim them at steve uh, one, the first woman in a man's voice says, stay right where you are, fly boy. Steve's jaw drops. He realizes he's been had. Then two girls approach Steve and the driver. We realize the first woman is Ashley Norman, who yells, shut up. So then they have a fight in drag. And Holy Steve is fighting cow. them. Yeah, they're Nazis in, in drag here. Right. That's amazing. This is I've, a Shades of Milton Berle and, and Harvey yeah. Corman. Yep. I'm certain that would have been the actor's first time in drag. That day, <laughs> that hour. <laughs> that's so. That's so great. What I love about this scene again is uh, once, once uh, in the version that airs, once uh, Ashley Norman reveals himself and points the gun. Uh, th it's this whole thing that's set up simply so that What's Anne Ramsey wrong? can run back into her off, taxi, and and <laughs> so that Lau <laughs> Wagner can turn and go. Hey, taxi, don't make a move. Are we gonna mess up that pretty little soldier studio? And it's it's brilliant. <laughs> Anne Ramsey, when she shows up in Mind Stealers, she's a bus driver. Right, right. She's always she's carting people all around all the time. Do we think that she is the that's the taxi driver's daughter? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's a uh, taxi woman junior. Yes, that's what taxi I thought. Taxi woman junior. <laughs> Kaput. That's awesome. I say we kill the pig now. On the way to life. Idiot, we do that, the Gestapo will have us killed. Let's get him back to the apartment. Schnell! Schnell. Nurse Buck. Yes? Major Trevor? Mm -hmm. He's not in his room. Now we come to one of my favorite bits. I'm sure it's, it's one of the highlights of this. Here is the wonderful first wonder spin. Diana asks Nurse Buck, where the hell is Steve? And uh, Nurse <laughs> Buck, I love this character. I love this this I actor. She's just like, you know, oh, he's a, he's such a great soldier. And, you know, he wanted to just get back to the war. So I let him. Yeah, yeah. 
And single too. And single too. Yeah. It's a good thing he's single. <laughs> uh, so uh, nurse Diana Prince, you know, she uh, makes her way to an empty corridor, and here we have the first wonder spin in all its slow mo glory. In the script, it's a closet. What? Really? Yes. In the script, it says she goes into a closet and then she comes out as Wonder Woman. Obviously, they added the 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 turning, the transformation. Uh, but what was it originally? Do either of you know? Well, now hold on here because the one that I have, the one that you provided me with, or the version, one of the versions you provided me with, Andy, it says in type she spins. Into Wonder Woman. That was the final, final, final shooting script. It's final shooting script, fourth revision is what I have. Right. That's what mine says, too. <laughs> That's what it says up top. January 3rd, 1975. That's what yours says, too? That's because they would add colored pages and make it different drafts. Mm -hmm. Sure. What's your first page? Is your first page blank uh, with the... No, my first page no. is in type, new original, new comma original, and then Wonder Woman is its own typeface, in quotes. Right. Yes. And then I got a lot of handwritten notes, like Seven Darden, Second Spy is written on it. Okay. Call NBC, ABC about censor fights. Yeah. Mine just says revised fine. Okay. I have Linda Carter's telephone number. So, Ray, you've got 4C, Paul, you have 4B, and then there's a 4A. So... Do you have 4A? Yeah. The one that Paul has with the notes on it is actually somebody's literal shooting script. I love that. I love that. Yeah, because I got, you know, call ABC about notes. You. I know, and you know I love that stuff. I love that behind the scenes stuff. I got Linda Carter's phone number. Anybody wants it? Of course, it's, yeah, back it's like then. 45 years old. Whose shooting script was it? Do we know that? I don't it's know. somebody on the crew. It has to be a technical person because they're calling they're writing notes about calling ABC about censor about the Censoring fight. Censoring the fight. Yeah. yeah. Ah. Oh, I wonder then if that the punches and kicks were part of that. If you notice in the scripts, there's some scenes omitted. What happened there? On this script, um, 4A, my script says 210 through 212 are omitted. Yeah. On my script, page 74, it's uh, Wonder Woman revised March 10th, 1975. Diana now looks both ways down the hall. No one is coming. In uniform, she spins rapidly around and is transformed into Wonder Woman, and the next scene's omitted. The next scene is she takes off down the hall in a flash, past startled interns and patients fade out. Yeah, that is the, that's 4B. Right. So uh, what did you want to share with I us? I have 4A and 4C and 1A on my screen. All right. And, what is uh, what do you what's on one A? Yeah, what's one A? Here's what actually happened in the original script. Uh oh. Diana looks both ways down the hall, now walks to the broom closet and opens it. Whereupon we and I'm paraphrasing here because it's a page and a half of stuff, whereupon she sees a pair of young interns kissing. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, a, a young intern doctor and a nurse, and he tells Diana Hi, we'll be out in a minute. Then it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, Stanley oh Ralph Ross. This is at which his case, first Diana, tackle at it. Don't you love it? Diana goes, "Oh, I'm sorry." So then she closes the door, wondering if she'll ever know that joy. Wow. Opens another closet, goes in. Steps inside, the first closet door opens, the young couple walks out, adjusts their clothes, the intern looks at his wrist wristwatch and says, I can't understand it. We've had we had the closet from five to five fifteen. I put the time up on the hospital bulletin board myself. <laughs> This is like this is this is comedy. This is the comedy that you'd see this on like funny. you know Laugh In or 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 Carol Burnett. It's great. Uh, the nurse says maybe her watch was fast. I think that's the new nurse, Diana Prince. She's a little strange. <laughs> <laughs> the doc doctor says that explains it. Well, tomorrow you tell her the facts of life around here. Okay. Wow. The nurse says okay. He says, see you at 9.30. She says, same time, same closet. So from 5 to 5.15, they have on a bulletin board at the hospital that this intern and this nurse get to have the closet for smooching. 
And then they're pigs, so they have it again at 930. <laughs> so finally... You gotta let out that stress, that <laughs> hospital stress. After they walk away, Wonder Woman comes out of the second closet in her, quote, regulation uniform. She holds for a second, can't resist a womanly smile, then takes off down the hall. Wow. They didn't care about the transformation of Wonder Woman. They had to get the <laughs> no-name intern and the no-name nurse discussing telling her about the facts of life. I think that that's interesting. because, I, In a way, it sort of lets you into the thinking, obviously, of Stanley Ralph Ross, but that they didn't have a way for her to transform, so they tried to surround it with comedy instead. Exactly. Right. Then let's get down to it. At some point, they feel between my script and Ray's and certainly Andy's A script, they decided that they were going to do a transformation, a transformation on camera. I remember the day on the set when we did the first spin. And we were trying to figure out what kind of movement, what, how we should shoot it. And uh, I said to Leonard, well, I can, you know, I, I can do a spin. Because that wasn't in the comics. And he said, well, show me. And I showed him. And he said, that's great. Let's do that. And I think you came down. And I did it for you. Then we decided to put the, the clothes in front and right. all the rest of it. She simply spins around. And it was and it works. Yep. And it became immediately iconic. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. I think it's I think it's fantastic. I have vague memories of, of watching these early ones. Um uh, at first run, that's how old old we are. The 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 junior here, Ray, uh, who watched this, you know, in the '90s, he first saw this. The, oh. the youngin. Yeah. Yes. Yes. This particular episode. I'm so offended. You're calling me young. <laughs> <laughs> how dare you, sir? How dare you? Um. Well, first of all, what do we think about the slow motion transformation? Now we know why they had to do it, and and you you hear Doug Kramer talk about how it's it was very expensive, and and it was because you basically had to have her spin, mm -hmm. lock down the camera, keep it a hot set so that no one does anything, no one changes or moves anything, which they'll have trouble with later, but wait until she changes into her suit and then get her back on the set and in the same position and then roll them, and then you had to match these together, and and when this and this is 1975, so the they. You're talking about doing a dissolve with actual film. Today, all three of us could do it in five seconds in iMovie, in, you know, Adobe Premiere, you know, I work with Avid. Again, it's it's five, it's a dissolve. You, you add it, boom, you're done. Um, but back then it was very uh, time consuming and, and costly. What do we think about the slow motion transformation? Ray? <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, on the spot. Uh, on the spot, Ray? I like the slow motion transformation. I think it gives a nice, uh, it lets you see what's happening underneath the burst of light. Mm -hmm. Or it gives you an, it's something to ignite your imagination. I do think, I mean, obviously the burst of light works much better for an action sequence. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't mind, I'm, I'm into the slow-mo. I love it. That's really all I have to say. I... <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have to say about that. Um, I love it. I, It's so simple. Mm -hmm. And yet, when I was a kid, it was magical. Yeah. I mean, yes, the burst of light also becomes magical for me in the early, you know, first seasons. As you and I have talked about, Ray, in later seasons, it's just like, okay, burst of light, done. These early bursts of light and these early, these three episodes that have the, the slow motion spin... They were just fun to watch as a kid. Yeah. And because they were slow motion, they took a long time. It was its own thing. Yeah. You know, the, the transformation was its, was its own sort of set piece. And I, I adore it. Uh, Andy, what do you think about the slow motion? Well, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting mirror image of what they were doing with Superman and Batman at the time. Right. Uh, in this, in the adventures of Superman, he would duck into a closet, duck into a phone booth, whatever it was he was going to duck into as Clark, and then he would just emerge as Superman with a with a cut. And with Batman and Robin, as we as we discussed, they would go into the the poles and come out as Batman and Robin. So we never saw how the uh, the food was made, so to speak. And here we're seeing 
how something happens. And I think there were two reasons for that. Number one, they they hadn't obviously hit on the flash of light, the bongos and all that. But beyond that, beyond it being kind of cool and, you know, here's how it's done, it's also sexy. It's a woman undressing on screen in slow motion. So for all the dads that were watching this, this was kind of this was a moment for them. But there's the thing I have with that. I, I, I people have said that over the years that it was a slow motion strip tease, and I think we've talked about this before, Paul. That word strip tease. That, that she's not taking off her clothes. Right. It's just two spins, and she's holding the clothes. Right. Right. I think it's a it's a, the shorthand of language. The shorthand of language is if you were to say. Well, how does she spin? To say a slow motion strip tease instantly brings a sort of idea to someone's mind, as opposed to saying, "Well, it's a slow motion uh, clothes swap." Right. Yeah. One is much more technical, and you definitely understand what you mean. But strip tease adds, as Andy had brought up, a sort of sexiness to it. Now, whether that's good or bad, well, we've got opinions. Right. I don't know. I, 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 it's funny. I don't call it a slow motion strip tease. I call it the slow motion transformation. I'm very, I'm always very specific in, in how I look at it. And and but I I totally see how that was the shorthanded uh, description that people all the go to description was you know the the slow motion strip tease. Well, you'll notice I never said that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> It is a very graceful spin. It is. Certainly the most graceful of the slow spins. Later on, she'll like wind up yeah. and then release. Here she doesn't do any winding at all. I do love the attitude she walks away with. She's oh, like, yeah, like uh, yeah, I just changed. Yeah. Here's the close. <laughs> Goodbye. But that brings us to the end of act five. And now we are in the final act of this pilot movie. Wonder Woman will continue in a moment. Wonder Woman is one of the greatest, most long-lived and visibly recognizable icons of female empowerment the world has ever known. That's a crushing weight of expectation to place on someone's shoulders. And Princess Diana of the Amazons has faced scathing criticism for her entire existence as a result. I'm Diablo Frank, and I've been a fan of the Amazing Amazon for my entire life. But she didn't become one of my absolute favorite superheroes until the 1990s. That doesn't seem all that long ago to me, but every year I meet more adults who are otherwise preoccupied getting born around them, so I guess it's been a spell. I try to be a good feminist and all-around decent guy, but I'm still a human being chock full of character flaws laws, quirks, and hang-ups that make me less than anyone's ideal. Despite being an admirable heroine fighting for her rights in her satin tights, Wonder Woman is as human as Adam, and they have the same basic origin. But boy, did that guy make a mess of things. Shouldn't we extend someone with Wonder Woman's track record the same courtesy and empathy we can and should offer to the rest of the world? To be truthful, I'm not a typical fan of the Paradise Island set. I'm not big on mythology, and I'm highly critical of the most popular Themyscirin stories. I like it when Wonder Woman loses her powers and hangs out with a tiny blind Asian martial arts master named Ai Ching, or when she works at Taco Bell and helps collect child support for a co-worker from a deadbeat mafioso dad, or when she rides around on kangaroo ponies from outer space and is a little too into bondage and spanking for the squares. Wonder Woman is great, but I really miss Diana Prince, the reminder that the heroine feels and fails and bleeds like the rest of us. That's why I call my podcast about her Diana Prince Wonder Woman, and the music playing in the background is from the off-model Kathy Lee Crosby TV movie from 1974, because I like to remember there's a woman behind all that wonder, and I'd like to talk about her if you care to listen on iTunes and the Internet Archive. Act six opens up. Marcia uses truth serum to get the safe combination from Steve. Uh, you trust me, don't you? Oh, sure, my Marcia. You're my good friend. Mm, yes, I am. <laughs> now, give me the combination. Steve, the whole country is depending on you. The whole country? Millions of people. Millions of people? For old glory? Twenty-four left. Twenty-six right. And thirty-three 
to the left. <sighs> we cut to the safe. Marcia has opened it up, and in comes Wonder Woman. And this is the big confrontation, and it's the big fight. I knew it was you all the time. You didn't know anything. Well, I knew that you had a friend who carried a machine gun in her purse. And you won't get away with whatever you're doing. Oh? And who's going to stop me? Marcia draws a gun. You of all people should realize how useless that gun is against me. Marcia considers the gun and then puts it down. I don't need a gun to take you, Wonder Woman. And then strikes a judo pose. I was Nuremberg Judo Camp. Wonder Woman I starts closing the doors to the office. That that is supposed to impress me. Marcia picks up a knife, throws it at her, misses, it hits the wall, and it begins. I love this fight. It is an, an outrageous fight. Yes, it's it is. It's campy. It's beautifully choreographed. Yes, it is. And it makes me laugh every single time. Uh, Doug Kramer says that he showed this fight to the Dynasty writers when they were prepping Joan Collins and Linda Evans for their big fight. In the script, it is contained in that office, as well as the lasso interrogation and the phone call. Uh, everything is in that office. And um, in my script, Marcia doesn't kick off the fight with a knife throw. But I love this to death. And the music, what do you guys think about the fight? I certainly think it's one of the best, if not the best, in the entire series. And I'm not sure we get a fight this choreographed until Richest Man in the World. Oh, God, yeah. When, she, when she's kicking ass and taking names. Yeah, like, that's really the first time that she starts punching and kicking again. This is by far the, the biggest fight. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm just marveling at the choreography and that they're both really doing this. And Stella Stevens is so in it. And the fact that it's between her and another woman is especially important here. Uh, and it's part of how they got things past the censors, as, as you saw on the notes in front of your script, Paul, that, that there was questions about the fights, yes. what they could do and what they couldn't do. You'll notice that the, that the way they've shot it is largely in the darkened room and darkened quarters and so forth. Yes. Part of the reason they wanted to do that was to cover up the padding that they had to put on uh, Marcia. They really couldn't pad Linda Carter for these scenes because her costume didn't allow much in the way of coverage. <laughs> right. But Marcia has pads all over the place, and you can actually kind of see them if you pause in certain places. But because they shot it so closely, even in the dark, they couldn't use a lot of stunt people. But if you watch this scene by scene, there's almost no stunt people in the shot. The one biggest shot that has a stunt person is them going through the candy glass door. Right. And throwing her over the desk, too. Yeah. Uh, but the candy glass window that's not Linda. Then when she falls onto the glass, it is Linda. But there's very, very few shots that are actual stunt people. The this picture is... going, you know, going over Linda's head, mm -hmm. that's Linda. She's taking yeah. that thing over right, her right. head, okay? And then she has to fall down on that. That's not easy. Um, that is Stella Stevens smashing a balsa wood chair over Linda Carter. And she's having so much fun doing it. I think I talked about this in the in the last, in part one. I uh, attended a screening of the Poseidon Adventure in Hollywood at the at the Egyptian Theater uh, a couple of years ago. And and some of the cast were there. Um, and this is, again, this is a movie where Stella uh, worked with Red Buttons. But Stella Stevens was there in person to talk with people. And I got a picture of her, and it's up on the show notes for part one. Uh, but I asked her, and uh, you know, that fight you did with Linda Carter, you know, that big rousing fight, that was you and her, right? Actually fighting. And she looked at me and she said, yeah, sure, kid. And she winked. And I love that <laughs> because it was them, except for a few instances where uh, she had to be stunted. It really was them. And you're right. They had a ball. And I'd just like to say she did it all in heels. She didn't have, <laughs> she didn't have the magic boots yet. Right, right. <laughs> They didn't teach you to fight fair. I love it. I love it so much. And it is a knockout punch. Marcia goes flying in the chair through the doors. Uh, and now she gets a lecture. 
<laughs> she gets uh, she well here comes the first uh, here comes the magic lasso right mm-hmm. you know this is the first you know there's so many firsts about this about Wonder Woman's mythology in uh, as it is depicted visually here right and even in the the movie 2017 the the Gal Gadot movie you know where Steve is is tied with it and he's just uncomfortable well here's Stella Stevens yeah. she plays it as uncomfortable mm-hmm. yep no sound effect it's it's uh they're relying more on the actor to sell it than than any tricks absolutely and and you know it it really you know she sets it for every other actor mm-hmm. how they're going to be bound with the lasso it's very like you know she's trying to lie and she can and it hurts and all that stuff now you are going to tell the truth i don't bother fighting it that lasso compels you to be honest and you must answer every question where is steve trevor this particular scene also is the introduction of the the wonder voice mimicking yes (laughs) it's wonder ventriloquism wonder ventriloquism diana (laughs) travelina I love it. I love that that mimic power. I do too. Right. I wish. I wish it would have stayed stuck around. Yeah. You know. It's. I. W- I wish. Again, uh, the first season is full of the. It, it has all the magical stuff. It really does. Um, because, well, right here she's winning the lip sync. Right. So Shantae, she stays. <laughs> here also is the the lecture. Yes. Uh, sisterhood is stronger than anything. Oh. I love that line so much. It is such a powerful and potent thing. And and we're going to see a little bit more of this in season one, but it's going to very quickly dwindle and go away. Yeah. Almost after the specials. Yeah. It's really, it's really going to fall away. We'll get even with you for this. My people will send more agents. No, the Nazis don't care about their women. They let you fend for yourself. And any civilization that does not recognize the female is doomed to destruction. Women are the wave of the future, and sisterhood is stronger than anything. Wonder Woman speaks into the phone with Marsha's voice. This is Marsha. The plans have been changed. I'll be there an hour later. What about the rendezvous with the submarine? Advise them of the alteration. No! You are going to stay right where you are. You must obey. I must obey. And to think that Steve Trevor was fooled by you. I'm going to have to get accustomed to men and devious women. As wonderful as that speech is in here, in my script, there's a little bit, uh, an added bit to it. The speech ends with uh, Wonder Woman dialing zero and saying there's a spy in Steve Trevor's office. Mm. And then she says to Marcia, goodbye, Marcia. I hope you will use your time in prison to think about your past and what the future can be for you and all women. Mm -hmm. Now, why this wasn't left in, I don't know, but, but it's again, it's uh, what we got on screen was fantastic. And this little bit in the script goes to show you how it was just, it was, there was just even more. I did want to point out a, a kind of funny thing about the, the lasso in the script. Um, it says Wonder Woman wraps Marcia in the golden lasso as fast as any cowpoke ever tied a calf's legs <laughs> in a rodeo. And I just thought, well, all right then. This is very much a, a product of the 70s because, you know, anybody watching that might know what a cowpoke in a rodeo would be. But if you put that in a script now, people would be like, a who, what? Oh, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah. I mean, well, you're coming out of the '60s and '50s, where where your main you you had science fiction and westerns, right? And then your favorite line there, the sisterhood is stronger than anything um, line. Uh, you'll notice that was mirrored and used again. Where was it used, Paul? Oh, um, 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 where was it? Oh, it was in your comic book. It was Wonder <laughs> Woman '77 meets the Bionic Woman. I I was adamant that I was going to use that line again. And uh, it's my favorite line of the whole series. And I was writing towards that line because I felt it was such an important line. And so it so crystallized what uh, William Moulton Marston's view of Wonder Woman was 
in in such a small amount of I mean it was just it was an amazing line to me and still is uh that that like if you want to know what Wonder Woman is about here you go can I just say and you just reminded me uh Andy uh, Marston this uh, uh, and we've t- we briefly touched on it this whole this whole movie and the things that she says and the things that happen you know Stanley Ralph Ross really wrote it like a, a Marston comic book of the golden mm-hmm, age. Mm-hmm. It's really, it's really kooky and goofy. And she says things that otherwise might be corny and cheesy, but it has such conviction yeah. that it comes out beautifully. And that's what, and, and Marston wrote these, wrote the same kind of words uh, in his comics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and she's smiling throughout the episode. She's confident. Um, even though, you know, she's, she's the fish out of water. But she has that golden age um, atmosphere about her that this is all fun for her. Yeah. Yeah. She's kind of semi amused by everything. <laughs> yes. mm-hmm. Actually, if you, you know, when you watch the 2017 Gal Gadot movie, uh, she does some of that as well. Yeah. Once she gets to Man's World uh, in London, it's there's this element of bemusement on her face at almost all times with the exception of when she's fighting. And that is a difference between what Linda did and what Gal did. Um, It's that Linda still kept it, kept that look of bemusement, whereas Gal uh, kind of would become serious when she fought. Yeah, more warrior-like, and for Linda's Wonder Woman, it's more games-like. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that was... I'd be interested, if I I ever get to interview uh, Patty and Gal... Um, I'd be interested to see if that was a choice inspired by Linda or whether it was a choice that just seemed natural to them. But I feel like either way, uh, as we know, Patty was super inspired by the Wonder Woman TV show. Yeah. So even if she says, oh, it just seemed natural to me. I'm I'm still gonna think. Oh, it was probably inspired by Linda when you did this. Yeah, subconscious. Yeah, right. Because right. it certainly wasn't something we didn't see that in Bionic Woman. We didn't see it in Charlie's Angels. We didn't see it on Police Woman or any of the other female centric shows. Wonder Woman was the only show in which uh, Isis did it a, a little tiny bit. But, yeah, Isis did it a little bit. But really, Wonder Woman was the only show in which the the heroine kind of was just tickled by what was going on and was never terribly concerned that things wouldn't work out. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Well, if, in the first season, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. She gets really cynical later on, and uh, yes, you know, I, I call it the tire kicking Diana Prince. Uh, but we'll get to that. Yeah. I understand that evolution, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you you said something very poignant, where in that I never forgot, Ray. And you said that you learned how to be sarcastic from from CBS Diana Prince. <laughs> <laughs> That's that sounds like something I'd say. But I I I totally get that that you learned how to be sort of you know look sideways at somebody the way Diana Prince yeah. looks sideways at people. <laughs> yeah, or or her eye roll. Yeah, exactly. Act six continues. We intercept Von Blasco. Coming Von Blasco. Calling Von Blasco. Robot twenty three. Calling. You were ordered to maintain radio silence. Plans changed. The estimated time of departure now, 0200 hours. That's 2 a.m. Nay! Nay! We will rendezvous at midnight. At midnight. As the others are late, they will pay for their tardiness with their lives. Again, we see that wonderful plexiglass invisible airplane. We get the, um, you must learn respect. I love Mm -hmm. that to no end. Who are you? You're welcoming committee. I don't think so. Just nose your plane down to the closest airstrip and everything will be fine. No one can stop this mission. Least of all, a woman. You obviously have little regard for womanhood. You must learn respect. I prefer not to soil my hands on female flesh. But if you insist... 
punches Von Blasco clear across the jaw, knocks him out. Love it. Uh, goes to the radio, does another wonder ventriloquism as Von Blasco, gets the position of the U-boat that's there to pick up Marsha and her gang, and then nosedives the plane yep. into it, killing everybody. But does she? She means business. <laughs> There's no way. I mean, she could, they, they might have swam up. You know. <laughs> well, you know... <laughs> 70s television, there's always like, you know, you would see in the season two uh, final episode, uh, what is it? The Missiles episode. Murderous uh, Missile. The Murderous Missile. It's a very brown episode. Right. It's a weird scene where Wonder Woman is is dodging uh, dual Jeeps. Uh, they sort of collide and crash and you see a big explosion and you think, oh my God, she's just killed these guys in the Jeeps. But then you see them come like come up over the over the hill and they're like oh my back and, and it's like they didn't die i mean that's what i'm talking about if they go to they go to these lengths of of showing you that nobody actually died they did not do that here not here no see that's that's why i say i don't believe she actually killed them i think that they that they swam to the surface look they didn't get out of the cock duty car andy whereupon aquaman <laughs> and his school of fish rescued them <laughs> Except for, except for the mean ones, and then he let the sharks eat them. That's good. Okay, I'll they go just, with that. They just didn't have that. They didn't have the room to show that on screen. They had to. They had to cut scenes for, <laughs> you know, for length. I think they're dead because are they just plainly dead, or are they really, really? I'm trying to do the most sincerely, really, most, most sincerely, sincerely dead. dead. Yes, yes. Do, do, do. I think they are sincerely dead because the script says the explosion lights up the sky with a tremendous blast of and fire. <laughs> oh, and suddenly, the sea is still once more, and there is no evidence of anything having happened. Wow. Well, there goes there go, there go, goes your, your swimming bodies, Andy. Nah, I don't see it. <laughs> I, I wanted to mention <laughs> yes. about the invisible plane, because I'm new to Star Trek now. Um, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. That's shows. right. Yes. You're a newbie. Okay. So we see that the invisible plane has some sort of tractor beam or magnetizer going on. But in the script, uh, they do say that she releases her ladder and climbs down her ladder into Von Blasco's plane. In my script, it's a rope. But I love how Ooh. there are slight differences between A, B, and C. This is great. Thank you, Andy, for introducing that whole yeah. wonder script. Yeah. <laughs> now, if one freeze frames the explosion on the submarine, it's very clear that, number one... <laughs> it the plane, the plane crashes into the water, oh, dear. not the submarine. Uh -huh. There's an explosion of water. Yes, explosion of water. Yes, and the conning tower uh -huh. on the submarine is still intact, and uh, the front half of the submarine is still intact. Oh my god, I so, buy it. I buy it. You so changed my mind. <laughs> it's certainly Wait, possible it that it. He really he didn't change my mind at all. It severely <laughs> damaged the submarine. Anybody but still listening? He didn't change my mind. Not mine either. Unlike, um. <laughs> <laughs> unlike what it says in the script, it's not a brilliant flash. It is a, the plane crashes into the water. Okay. Uh, so I'm just not, I'm not going to accept <laughs> that she has just killed a submarine full of, of German seamen. Hold on, give me a second. I might have... Don't give that man a second! <laughs> <laughs> my, my wheels are turning. Wonder Woman will continue in a moment. Beautiful as Aphrodite. Wise as Athena. Stronger than Hercules. Swifter than Mercury. Explore the 75-year history of the Amazon Princess with Wonder Woman, Warrior for Peace, a monthly podcast available on iTunes, Stitcher, and at wonderwomanwarriorforpeace.wordpress.com. Popping back just a minute, uh, earlier in this podcast, I had talked about uh, meeting Susanna Mars, and... Uh, who was the daughter of Kenneth Mars. Yes. Local Chanteuse. Local Chanteuse, Susanna Mars. Susanna Mars, who was the daughter of Kenneth Mars, and that she remembered her day on set and meeting Linda Carter. And this is the this is the scene she was there. Oh, my God. She was actually there in the cockpit for some of the filming. 
watching her dad and Linda interact. So if you if you watch this scene with the knowledge that there's like a, a six or seven or eight year old little girl sitting there watching her father get beat up by Wonder Woman, it wow. makes it all the more fun. And that she's now grown up to be a semi-famous local chanteuse. You again! This man is a top Nazi spy. Wonder Woman drops off Blasco to the police. Put him in a cell and throw away the key. You just can't just dump a spy and walk away like that. He's got to come into the station house and fill out some reports. Good night, gentlemen. With fabulous hair, she does this. In my script, it's largely the same, but with a few more words from Wonder Woman about how if men spent more time getting things done instead of writing reports, they'd get more done in half the time. I agree with that. Do you recognize the police station, by the way? Isn't it's from, isn't that it's, uh, City Hall? Yes. On Batman. <laughs> it's been in Lois and Clark. We'll see it in Judgment from Outer Space. Uh, exactly. It's the Treasury Building. Yes. Oh, it's not the Commissioner Gordon's... Uh, uh... I didn't say that. Oh, okay. I was saying that it's <laughs> on Wonder Woman. Right, right, on Wonder right. Wonder Woman, it's the Treasury Building. That's where she, she stands between those two pillars in her skirt. The one that didn't prove cumbersome. Right, right. I think it has a nice, it's a much more, it's a nice sort of stylistic uh, star pattern on that little skirt. I do it like absolutely that. is. It absolutely is. And the it's... slit in the, down the side. Yes. If you watch that video that Paul edited together of me on the various Wonder sets, I'm actually standing, uh, standing in that spot as well, too. But you don't have your Wonder skirt on, Andy. I don't have my Wonder skirt on, nor do I have an unconscious German on my shoulder. <laughs> But you wanted to. <laughs> I wanted to, yes. That's right. Yes, you were correct. Um, okay, moving on. After you killed them. No. <laughs> Wonder Woman saves Steve. Ten minutes of one. Marsha looking at something doesn't answer. Something's wrong. Let's kill him and get out of here. No, no, no. Marsha said to wait until one o'clock. You can stay if you want, but I'm going to leave now. All right, let's plug him. Get out of here. I love this little bit where she knocks down the door. So, Mr. Norman, my old friend the agent, we meet again. Early syndication commercials, they use this scene a lot. You know, coming to Channel 25, it's Wonder Woman. And she's 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 breaking down that door and she's, you know, I, I love that. That is such a cool image. It really is. Of her breaking that door down. They don't stay on her once she falls into her, her stance. They don't, they could have rested on her just a little bit longer, but they go right into the action. This scene is the best, the best. Uh, I laugh every single time. You know, uh, everyone starts, you know, shooting at her. And of course, red buttons, <laughs> Ashley Norman has to shoot at her. But he's so totally disgusted and over himself that he knows this gun is doing nothing whatsoever. And red buttons plays it for all it's worth. Like, yeah. this is ridiculous, but I'm going to shoot anyway. It cracks me up every single time. Me too. And then, of course, she uh, leaps on the couch. Again, Linda Carter leaping up onto that sofa, doing what we all did as kids, you know, if we did, if we could get away with it, and, and making the sofa sort of tilt on its back. And then she goes into the kitchen, swings around Ashley Norman, throws him against the other thugs. They're out for the count. And then she gets to tell Steve that, uh, that uh, Marcia is a bad girl. Well, you missed, you missed, completely glossed over the... the, 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 the what did the, I gloss the, over now, Andy? The, 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 the big, the big bear in his pocket knife. Oh, Severn Darden! Ah! Aploy. If you watch the beginning of the scene, he's standing there staring off into space <laughs> in an action pose. He's so, like he, he's so like dumb, he, yeah. He doesn't realize that they called action three minutes ago, and he's standing there in this action pose, and then he kind of like wakes up and he's like, oh, where am I? And then, you know, and then when, they, when they're shooting at her, rather than ducking from the ricocheting bullets that are inches, inches from his face, he says, I know, a pocket knife. I'll <laughs> scream at her with a pocket knife that isn't even opened. Right. Well, I if, mean, it's. Listen, if you watch Seven Darden's performance in this whole pilot, he is the the, the rocks for brains yeah. thug. He's like, I, I gave him the shot. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, he's such a goof. And mind you, this is the same guy that plays a super intelligent alien scientist. In the Six Million Dollar Man and Bionic Woman, Aploy. 
Uh, and uh, if you look up Seven Darden, he was a great humorist, uh, comedian. And uh, if if the word buffoon could be applied to anyone, it would be his character right, in this right. pilot. If he wasn't already brain damaged ah! when she throws him headfirst into a concrete wall, he's, <laughs> right. he's, he's going to be mixed up by then. It's you. Mm-hmm. Well, how did you... Look, I've got to get out of here. There's a spy plane on the way to New no, York. No, there I... isn't. The Brooklyn Navy Yard is safe, and so is the Norton bomb site. You knew what they were after? Von Blasco's in jail. His XB-13 is at the bottom of the Atlantic, along with the submarine that was to pick up these men. And Marsha. Marsha? She was the leader of the pack, Steve. A most untrustworthy associate. Marsha. Ray, you talk about the rule of three, the comedy of Marsha, Marsha. Marcia. Marcia. I don't know. I just love things like that. I've taken care of everything, Steve. Even Marcia? <laughs> Marcia? Marcia. <laughs> Marcia, Marcia, Marcia. Yeah, do we think that that was an actual uh, reference to Brady Bunch? <laughs> no. I don't know. I you don't think, think so. Because so. Brady no. Bunch had been on the air for a couple of years by then. Mm -hmm. Marcia, Marcia, Marcia was a phrase. So couldn't Marcia, Marcia, Marcia be a phrase? <laughs> You know, I can't tell when Andy's playing us. It can't. I can't tell anymore. Yeah. I thought you wanted a real opinion, Andy. I, 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 You're trolling us now. I do want a real opinion because I absolutely do think that it was a Brady Bunch reference. <laughs> See, and I don't because I don't think that really became part of public consciousness until the Brady Bunch films in the 90s. Oh, interesting. We'll have to come back to that wonderful debate. I don't know. Having, um, having lived through that time period, I will say that people did. You, the 40s? Yes. <laughs> Oh, 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 through the Brady Bunch era. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, you know, I have to say that people did make references <laughs> to Marsha in real life. Like, that was an actual thing. If some girl was, was combing her hair, I remember. Oh, she's such a Marsha. Yeah, big yeah. references to that. Now the whole I'm going to bring that back. Marsha thing. I'm going to bring it that back. That might be from the movies, but I do remember that 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 references to Marsha from the Brady Bunch were a thing in the 70s. Some future podcast, I'm going to say, Ray, you're being such a Marsha. Um, okay. I'll say, you're being such a jam. <laughs> Is he being such a Marcia? A Marcia, that's a question. I would take that as a compliment. Except for the Nazi part. Right. She is very devious. And and I get that Ray is probably, you know, could be could be fairly devious. Can't we all? Ray doesn't have a devious bone in his body. You should know, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are quoting Wonder Woman. Get your minds out of the gutter. And then there's another, there's a, a, a super clever in-joke in this scene. Do you guys, uh, do you know what that is? The Wonder Bread. Yeah, yeah. Behind her on the counter, there is a, there's a loaf of Wonder Bread, the white, white wrapper with the red lettering and the blue dots. And it's very unusual for any TV show to have a name brand anything on screen. They always make up fake props. Who the hell is going to see it on their 13-inch black and white TV in 1975. Yeah. I just noticed it when the Blu-rays came out. Me too. Same here. Oh, oh, see? See, you're just... We're such noobs. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I should say uh, I noticed it when the HDs came out about 10 years ago. I really have to go now. Oh, now, wait a minute. You can't just keep walking in and out of my life like this. Who are you? Where are you from? How are you able to do it? We'll be together again, soon, somehow. But I owe you my life. How can I ever repay? You said that this is the last time Lyle Wagner gets to be comedic during the entire series, Ray. I feel that. Please, somebody tell me if I'm wrong. You said earlier that this is this is a different Steve Trevor than any other it Steve is. Trevor, even in the first season. It is. It's such a full character, and it's really written to all of Lyle Wagner's strengths that he gets to do the comedy that he gets to he gets to fight he gets to be the the you know the handsome um, not damsel he gets to be the ha the handsome dan damsel he's a manzel he's demanzel in he's, distress he's a manzel in distress yeah but um, he really gets to play this attraction to wonder woman right. and it it it's just not the more watered down for children 
Steve Trevor, Diana Prince, Wonder Woman relationship that we get later. And he, he just that he gets to do this comedy, I think is wonderful. And I wish he got to do more of it. Mm-hmm. Agreed. We cut to, again, the wonderful comic book caption a few days later. At least I've learned one good thing. From now on, I'm going to have an ordinary-looking secretary. Well, I anticipated the way you'd feel, Steve, so I personally interviewed 15 prospective secretaries. The one I chose was a Navy wave who scored highest in all the office aptitude test, but she's duller than a fat lap dog after dinner. <laughs> she's duller than a fat lap dog after dinner. That is the Access Hollywood tape. <laughs> We have Steve Trevor being Billy Bush, right? and General Blankenship is Donald Trump here. Oh, Crazy. Absolutely. Yeah. Call HR. That's locker room talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There it is. He's waiting for you in your office right now. Good. I've had it up to here with pretty girls. Well, a man can get too much of a good thing. I love when they walk in and finally, Linda Carter as Diana Prince. Uh, Prince. Yes, General. Uh, Major Trevor, this is the Yeoman First Class, Diana Prince. In literal rose-colored glasses. Nice to meet you, Diana. Major? Uh, No rank around here. Let's just make it Steve and Diana, all right? Thank you, Steve. Good. Lyle Wagner always said that he preferred the season one, the wartime uh, era, because it's a uniform. One of the things about the updated Wonder Woman was that as Diana Prince, she was in these the most stylistic, fashionable clothes, and he was supposed to not know that she was Wonder Woman. And Lyle Wagner, I think it was in Andy's interview in Amazing Heroes, so I get it. I I totally see what Lyle Wagner uh, was saying. What do we think, because you've talked about the the symbolism of the globe in the the uh, the pilot so far which right. we've oh, seen yes. time and time again right and so when they open the door Diana Prince has her hat on top of the globe she just saved it it's right below the Capitol building I mean that's a very specific placement for her to put her hat it's not on the hat rack or the coat rack that's to the side it's on top of the globe so I think there's some symbolism there, but what do we believe it is? I, I believe that it's, don't worry, world, I am on top of this. I, 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 I am here, and I. it's almost like an embrace with the hat. The first time we see that globe, it's Von Blasco's hand that's on it. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and now, uh, because she's in Diana Prince mode, it can't be her tiara, but it's going to be her hat where she's, where it's like. It's very subtle. Yeah. I mean, I don't think most people would even would pick up on it. And it isn't until you start watching it frame by frame almost. Right. They go, wait a minute. There, there is that thing that we saw at the beginning with the Nazi with his hand. And now it's her with her hat on there. That really is one of the gifts of like recording this, you guys, is that we're being so trying to be intentional about what we're noticing. And, and you're, you're noticing these choices that were made that just fly over your head. Right. What I have found is that when you're watching it, uh, with some kind of purpose, like in preparation for something like this, uh, some things really pop out at you that you had overlooked the the previous 2000 times. Mm-hmm. And I love that. I love, what am I going to discover again? Because I mean, the the hat on the globe, I didn't think about it until until Andy brought it up. I'm so glad you brought it up. Could be, I love that bookend. But as soon as he brought it up, I'm like, oh my God, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Story's over. We're going to move on now. Yeah. Right. I I like the fact that Steve notices that Roosevelt is not on the is not on the on the wall anymore. It's been replaced with with uh, Washington. And we all know what happened to the Roosevelt mm-hmm. picture. It's, oh, it was smashed yes. over Wonder Woman's head. So when he looks at the Washington oh. picture, he's like, "What?" You know, <laughs> he does this little double take. And I've always loved that. It's like it's not necessary, but it's a wonderful sort of minutia. Because, yeah, he would be like, wait a minute, where's the where, who changed my pictures in my office? <laughs> well, I'll be off and let you two get acquainted. Oh, uh, just a minute, General. Um, did you get any further information on that uh, Wonder Woman? Not a thing. She vanished as quickly as she appeared. Uh, sort of uh, captivated by her, were you? <laughs> we'll talk about that some other time, all right? Of course, I understand. <laughs> So then we get to this wonderful thing where he's trying to write a letter, and she knows exactly what he's doing. Uh, take a letter, Diana. Take a letter to, um, uh, say, dear Miss, um... You're at a loss for words, sir? <sighs> yes. 
for the first time in my life. You see, I wanted to tell someone something and... And you couldn't say it? Well, I'm afraid I don't know how. Just say it. You mean straight out? Whatever the language, be honest. You're very perceptive, Diana. I'm a woman. Where I was brought up, women were taught to respect honesty. Now, I like that. You know, we're going to get along just fine. I'm sure we will. In the script, he actually specifies the very last shot when Diana's face occupies full screen and her smile is so broad with love and happiness that her cheeks may break, we freeze and go to end titles. And that will become the signature end frame for the whole series. Yep. Right, right. That The, the fact that he's literally writing in there that, that her smile is love and happiness. I mean, the, the whole thing, you can tell it on screen, but when you when you read the script with it, and you look at that and you say, all the messages that Stanley Ralph Ross was putting in here are so fantastic. And I think that that William Moulton Marston would have been overjoyed with this pilot. I agree with you, Andy. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I think that's a, a great note on that on that final shot. I love how we end this. We saw Linda leap off the comic book page into real life. Now we're going back into the comic. I love the bookend of the comic book. I, I think it's a very satisfying way to end this this pilot movie. What she says there at the end is once again a feminist message uh, where she's saying, whatever the language be honest, I'm a woman. It comes with the birthright. And, and, you know, that is, again, an example of them being as feminist as they could possibly be at a time when putting in feminist messages, even though it was the time of ERA and, and everything else, putting in overt feminist messages was difficult to do without it being clunky. And, and Stanley Ralph Ross found a way to make this work with all the feminism it needed for Wonder Woman. And to literally end on that was, I felt, very important. Talk about a balancing act in, a write, in writing the script. I mean, he's got vaudeville in here. He's got sort of hee-haw, hee-haw stuff. He's got sight gags. And he's got real uh, gravitas, uh, uh, feminism, virtues, and messages. Mm -hmm. And he, he, it's like it all fits. Because it's Wonder Woman. Right. And I love I love what Ray said about the rose-colored glasses, but he also says how the general and Steve just laugh. Yeah. Their number one enemy duped them for five years, and they're like, ha, 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 ha. Marsha. <laughs> I laughed out loud when I read that. <laughs> no, because you're absolutely right. We're men. Because she was pretty. I mean, that was, and that's literally <laughs> yeah. why she duped them, because she was pretty. Right. Yeah. And that's why, and that's why he wants them. Duller than right, a fat right. lap dog. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, interesting, now that we're talking about the uh, the volume or the, the, the levels of scripts, in your script, she's Lieutenant Diana Prince. She is Lieutenant Diana Prince. That is how General Blankenship introduces her. And in mine, it's Yeoman First Class. And it, it's, it's funny how they sort of demoted her mm -hmm. to Yeoman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For the final, for the final shot, um, because I I think she is a lieutenant in the uh, in the golden age. I'm not sure. I can't remember. I can't. I can't either. There was a lot of confusion at all times in the comic and in this series about who had what rank. You know, Paul. I remember when I was working on Wonder Woman seventy seven meets the Bionic Woman. There was a moment where you and I tried to figure that out. Oh, right, right. You know, like, what rank is Steve, and at what point did he change ranks, and at what point was he this rank, and what point was he that? It was a mess. Well, because you know, once we get into CBS, right, the fact that he has any military rank doesn't even come into play until later on in CBS, where somebody calls him Major Trevor, right, and then Colonel Trevor, and it's like, Trevor. it's like you were just Mister Trevor, a secret agent for the first half of season two. What? Right. It happened during that two-year gap, right, <laughs> between I do, I do, and the Man Who Made Volcanoes. So that brings us to the end of the new original Wonder Woman pilot movie. Um, what are our 
uh, final thoughts. For me, this story, fo- and, I, and I've, I, I think I've already given, a, given it away earlier, this story follows so much of the original comic book origins, uh, you know, combined from All Star number eight, Sensation one, and Wonder Woman number one. It's a mixture of all three so closely that it almost, at times, it's almost verbatim. And I think Stanley Ralph Ross, I mean, this guy wasn't playing around. Uh, it's so faithful to those comic book origins. The one thing that is conspicuous by its absence is any mention or any connection to gods or goddesses or any deity whatsoever. Uh, Ray and I talked about when we reviewed Kathy Lee Crosby's that uh, the, her Paradise Island was very mystical. It was almost, it was something very mystical. You knew that there were gods somewhere. In Linda Carter's Paradise Island and her origins, it's very regal. It's more majesty. It's more... You know, uh, there's there's no mysticism really going on here. There's no gods or goddesses. No, I don't think a god is mentioned until Athena in Return. Uh, The Return of Wonder Woman. Yeah. Other than that, I think this is a wonderful, no pun intended, uh, first origin story for Wonder Woman on TV. And I think it was done beautifully. The guest stars were amazing. The comedy was wonderful. And it was absolutely beautifully campy. And and well performed, and I think Linda Carter did a stellar, stellar job. Totally agree with everything that you said, and uh, I am so happy that uh, Linda is our Wonder Woman, and that she def- really defined this character and um, cemented her in public consciousness with this film. Agreed. Andy? I look at this pilot, and I say this with no small amount of gravitas, given, you know, my position in the in the comics community, which is everybody has known me for 35 years now as being kind of the guy who writes about the intersection of comics and Hollywood. And really, a lot of my career has been about interviewing these scriptwriters and these actors and reviewing the films and comparing them and everything else. So when I say this is the most faithful comic book adaptation ever filmed, that is not a hyperbole. That's that's pretty much uh, an inarguable fact. The closeness with which this mirrors the comic book itself and mirrors the intentions of the comic book's creators, it can omit some things, but it doesn't mess with established continuity in any form whatsoever. The amount of faithfulness in this adaptation uh, cannot be overstated. Uh, Beyond that, you have a cast that is exquisite. There is is no, no member of the cast that doesn't give it their all, even if their all is, is goofy or campy. They are absolutely, every single one of them is hitting a home run out of the park. Um, and, and Linda, you know, coming into this being her second major acting job, uh, you know, yes, she had done some TV guest star roles and things like that, but th- this and Bobby Joe and the outlaw were her, her first real acting jobs. Uh, so for her to come into this and I think her naivete, uh, is, uh, helpful to her in this because she's able to, to give it such purity and such, such realness Mm -hmm. and, and she's able to divorce herself from any element of camp. Mm -hmm. Now, Adam, Adam West, when he played Batman, did the same thing, but he was acting. He knew it was camp, and he and he controlled what he was doing, and he still had an edge to him that you knew that he was in on the joke. Whereas, whereas here, no matter what goofy stuff is happening, Linda is sincere, and yes. there's there's never a moment in here where she is not utterly one hundred percent sincere about her actions as Wonder Woman or as Diana. And that's a that's really a revelation. And I think the only actor who came close to that uh, or surpassed it in, at times was Christopher Reeve in the first two Superman films. Um, 
And and really, when people talk about super, uh, superhero films and comic book based films, they really talk about how Superman was so faithful and everything else like that. But if you look at it, it there's so many things about the Christopher Reeve movies that were not out of the comics and that were messing with it. You know, starting from Krypton forward, there were things that were not taken out of the comics. But you look at this and you can say, yeah, they left out the mystical elements or they left out Kangas. Kangas! Or they left out certain things. There is nothing in this film that wasn't in or wouldn't be in the comics. Agreed. Agreed. There's a really long answer to your question. No, it's a really long, <laughs> good answer to the question. And it's, uh, it's a great commentary. And you're right. You have been writing commentary. And I was in the comic book store today. Uh, I picked up a retro, ma- I'd never even heard of this magazine, Retro TV, and opened it up. Retro fan. Yeah, Retro fan. Opened it up, and there is it, it, it's Andy Mangles doing an interview with people from the Shazam Isis. Uh, I mean, come on. It's like, you're still doing it. You're all over the place. <laughs> uh, our guest has been Andy Mangles, uh, Wonder Woman, uh, historian, super uber fan, authority, uh, and, uh, and not only that, he's also, uh, he's written media tie-in novels for Star Trek and magazine articles up the wazoo. I'm not going to use that. I'm not going to say that, but maybe I am. Who knows? Thousands, thousands of magazines. And, <laughs> Andy, um, people want to get in touch with you. How do they get in touch with you? Where do they go to find out more about Andy Mangles? Uh, well, there's, you can always Wikipedia me. That's, that's the, the funny thing is that, uh, people are like, well, I don't know anything about your career. And I'm like, well, you didn't type very hard. <laughs> the biggest issue with finding me is spelling my name, right? Yes. It's like angels with an M in front of it. Right. And, uh, so if you go to Andy that, uh, that's my website. Uh, I'm on, you know, the Wikipedia has a very large page about me. Uh, I've got an IMDb page. Uh, I also run. Uh, I don't know if it's that large. I don't know if it's that large. I mean, it could be large. Oh, whatever. You know. <laughs> <laughs> what Wikipedia? The Wikipedia page is large. <laughs> I know. I know. Hello. I know. It's like, oh, come on, guys. Do we have to measure our Wikipedia pages? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I don't have one. I have. I have two uh, Wonder Woman sites that people should check out. The first being Wonder Woman Museum dot com, which is a bit out of date because I I update it when I can. And then the other being on Facebook, I run Wonder Woman Collectors Club, the larger of the two. There's two of them on there. Somebody got mad at me and, uh, and decided, <laughs> Some- decided they were going to start their own club. Somebody got mad at you on the internet, Andy? Yeah, yeah I know. I know. It's amazing. <laughs> So they started their own club with the exact same name. Look for the one that's like 10,000 people. Yeah. A lot of good stuff on there. I, I, I love going on there. Wonder Woman Collectors Club is 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 pretty insane. It's it's uh, got the largest amount of people and uh, a lot of exclusives get announced there and so forth. There's so much stuff on there I've never seen in my life. And I'm like, what the hell is that? And where did that come yeah. up? And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's pretty good. Yeah. It's pretty good. And then, of course, uh, Wonder Woman 77 meets the Bionic Woman, which... Um, is that in trade form now? That is tr- in trade form. And, in fact, it's almost out of trade form. Oh! Paul is actually in there. I wrote Paul in as a, as an IADC agent. I am. I'm Agent Paul. And you're Agent Bisson. Your 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 uh, name tag says, actually says your name. Okay. <laughs> and uh, But but Steve only refers to you as Paul. He right. never ca- or, or Agent. Well, you know, Steve and I are on it. Steve and I on a very personal basis, me and me. Yeah, and Steve. yeah, yeah. You're chummy. You <laughs> We've got you backstory. Steve. We've got backstory. I'll just say that. Just, I'll just tell you right uh, now. Agent Bisson's back and Steve Trevor's got it. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I get to write any more Wonder Woman 77, maybe we'll explore that backstory. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. So Wonder Woman 77 meets the Bionic Woman, um, which was one of the best-selling Wonder Woman titles of the last 10 years. Yes. The trade paperback came out, but because of the the vagaries of the fact that it was published by two companies, Dynamite and DC Comics, and because of the license holders and so forth, it got one printing, and that's it. Oh. So once once that one printing is sold out, that trade paperback will be going out of print. They are running. They are running now to Amazon. Get it. I would. If you don't have the trade, now's the time to get it. It will remain up, I think, on Comicology and some of those right. sites as a digital 
file. Well, I've got mine, and I just need it signed. So just uh, <laughs> I'm going to send that to you uh, very soon. Andy's going to be joining us on each episode in his own little segment. We're going to lock him away in a vault. And we're going to call it in the broom closet. In the broom, <laughs> we've just changed it to the broom closet. As long as I can make out with a medical intern. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to be. You have to fit in the right time on the schedule, Andy. So, right. Right. Uh, <laughs> but uh, on each on each edition of the podcast, we're going to check in with Andy, and we're going to take a look at what the script or any behind the scenes stuff that me he may have hidden away in his vault of, of stuff that he's acquired, whether it be um, in script form or whatever. Uh, and we're gonna we'll, we'll share that to you in our show notes, and we'll also talk with Andy about about the episode in that way. Um, we're also thinking about adding some really cool stuff. We're gonna talk about the comic books that were on the rack during the time an episode aired on television to give you an idea of what what we could go down to the store and start reading once once we got all hopped up on an episode of Wonder Woman. We wanted to write, run down to the Woolworths. I just aged myself. We wanted to run down. To the comic shop. To the five and dime. <laughs> five and dime. Five and dime and got a comic book. A funny book. Yeah. Or oh, Andy would go down to the soda jerk. The penny candy store. Yeah. Right. The penny candy store and and see what was on there. Um, in future editions of the show, we're going to talk about the music CD from La La Land Records. If you do not own this. It's wonderful. Yes. If you do not own this. You must. You must. It is three discs it covers the pilot movie that we just talked about. You can hear all the beautiful music, and it covers so much music from seasons two and three. Uh, Gorgeously remastered. Wonderfully, wonderfully done. And the Blu-ray. There are some things, I mean, and we'll talk about it as we talk about each episode. The pilot movie on the Blu-ray, I think the colors are a little wonky at, at, at points. Um, I think there's too much DNR, but I do love the cleanup that they've done, uh, removing scratches and debris. If you guys don't have any problem with it, that's all that matters. It's in HD. Wonder Woman in HD. The Wonder Bread pops out at you people. It does. Ray, the next episode we're going to be talking about has to do with a certain Baroness. But I thought that their activity had stopped since Steve <laughs> captured their leader, the Baroness Von Gunther, and put her in prison. That's why I'm worried. <laughs> <laughs> Steve could be in great day. Okay. Uh, next episode, the next edition of the Satin Tides podcast, we're going to talk about Wonder Woman meets Baroness Von Gunther. It's one of two specials that aired in April of 1976. More sort of golden agey type of uh, goodness with slow spin transformations. and There's a good one in that episode. Oh, yeah, yeah. And more, as Andy calls it, ventriloq vent wonder ventriloq... <laughs> wonder ventriloquism. Yes, what he said. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end. We are out of here. Ray Caspio is my co-host. Andy Mangles has been our guest. Thank you much, Ray and Paul. Thank you, Andy. I really enjoyed this chat. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. This has been so much fun. Ray, that's it. I'm going to see you later. I'll see you later. Till next time. Bye. Some of the music heard in this podcast is from the sensational La La Land Records official TV show soundtrack. Order yours at lalalandrecords.com. Special thanks to Susanna Mars for introducing this episode. Visit her at SusannaMars.com. That's Susanna, S-U-S-A-N-N-A-H. Susanna is currently working on a new short animated documentary called Morning Has Broken. It's about four artists grieving the loss of loved ones who collaborate to create a work of art together. Her special relationship with her dad is documented in the work. You can find links to the GoFundMe page and Susanna's blog in our show notes. Thanks once again to the inimitable Andy Mangles for exploring the pilot with us, and most importantly, thank you for listening. Be sure to find all of our episodes on our website, satintights.com. This is Ray Caspio saying we'll meet again when Wonder Woman meets Baroness Von Gunther. There was a show on television last week called Wonder Woman, which was a well-done show. It was wonderful. They, they tried it about a year ago, and they kind of played it straight, and that's what was wrong, because it's really a, a campy type of thing. And it was well done, and a lot of laughs. And the young lady who played Wonder Woman in there 
is, a, is named Linda Carter. And she, we thought you might like to meet her here tonight. Would you welcome Linda Carter? I saw the show the other night. Really, Did you? you were excellent. And I saw the whole show. Oh, well, thank and you. And I thought it was well done. And it was fun, and everybody seemed to be having a great time, and that's what it needed. That's exactly right. I think the way that they did it the previous time, they really didn't have fun with it. Yeah. They didn't do it and have fun, and all of us working with, uh, I mean, this is my first starring role. Is it your very first thing? My very first starring role. And I'd done two small parts, before, day player parts, you know. Yeah. And I tested for it in the weeks and weeks and weeks of waiting for the phone call, you know, the yeah. phone call. You were very good in it. You, Thank you. You wore a strange little outfit. Not too much of an outfit, but... <laughs> not too much, that's right. Kind of a red, white, and blue thing with your with magic stars. bracelet. And you... How was that done? It was done with pressing buttons on... Oh. had wires coming up into my hands and... Ching, ching. Now, are you going to do more of those? Is that going to become a, a regular type of thing? Or what did they tell you? Well, um, it depends on the ratings. And the ratings were terrific, yeah. as I understand. And uh, so, it's more waiting. Story's over. We're going to move on now.